Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. I am your host, Robert Winfrey. This is your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. On the agenda this particular episode, last night, UFC on ESPN 24. Boy, that poor card. Poor card. (laughs) Uh, We'll get into it. Uh, Also, a preview of the upcoming event, UFC 262, the vacant lightweight title, will be contested. And a really slow week this week on the news front. So, Bellator had a card, there was a boxing fight featuring uh, Canelo Alvarez. So, I'll I'll give you a few quick thoughts on that, and then we'll probably get out of here again. It's been a real quiet week. I mean, there's been some stupidity, uh, you know, Jake Paul kind of monkeying with Floyd Mayweather, uh, yeah. But I don't care about that. And I'm, I, I, it's, it wasn't enough to talk about, is more the thing. I, I don't go only by what I care about, personally. So that's what's on the agenda. If you uh, are here, please do like, comment, subscribe, review, share. All of it helps help spread the good word of the show. Uh, anyone that you think would be interested, please do let them know about us. Always helps. I'm recording this on Mother's Day here in the United States, so before I get into anything... Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, We literally would not be here without you. Uh, My own mother is fond of saying that she passed through the valley of the shadow of death to bring me into this world, frequently followed by a threat to take me out of it. (laughs) Uh, But uh, we, again, we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you to all the mothers out there. Uh, There's not really a whole lot more meaningful you can do with your life than uh, being a good mother. And that's not just uh, being a good parent in general, but because it's Mother's Day, I'm framing it that way. I say the same thing about fathers. Because it is just as true of them, and sadly, that's forgotten about all too often. All right. But that's what's on the agenda, so let's jump into this stuff. Last night, UFC on ESPN 24. When we did this last week, we did not actually have a main event for the card. (laughs) Uh, over the last week, it was announced it was it was in fact going to be the fight between Michelle Waterson and Marina Rodriguez. They fought at flyweight instead of strawweight. I believe this was a kind of a last week thing that uh, they negotiated for because they were going to go to five rounds instead of three. Excuse me, and I, which I find a reasonable request, all things considered. So that became our new main event. Uh, we lost two fights on weigh-in day. Uh, Felipe Linz had to withdraw from his fight with Ben Rothwell because of some illness. And Ryan Benoit, who was supposed to fight Zarek Adeshev, uh, he <sighs> horrible weight cut. I don't know if he was ill as well or what, but the man could not actually stand unassisted on the scale to be weighed in. So eh, that's a no-go. Uh, so that got removed. And then... The day of, turns out that um, Amanda Hebos and her father had both tested positive for COVID. So that fight with Angela Hill was also given the axe. We only had nine fights on this card. Uh, yeah. Yeah, only nine. Did not get a whole lot. <laughs> not get a whole lot out of this one. Uh, But anyway, main event, Marina Rodriguez and Michelle Watterson. Rodriguez wins via unanimous decision, 48-47 and two 49-46s. I believe that was 48-47. Rodriguez Rodriguez won the first three rounds. Uh, The first round, I think, was probably the closest of those three, but I gave it to her pretty comfortably. Uh, The last two, Watterson clearly took the fourth. Fifth could go either way. Uh, Any time Michelle Watterson got backed into the fence, which is surprisingly often, Rodriguez would find these long combinations. She kept landing her right hand. Watterson fought the majority of this fight southpaw. She normally switches a lot more than she did here. So that was a little bit interesting. Uh, She was landing her sidekick a lot. I mean, look, the joke with Michelle Watterson for years has been the invisible woman four inches in front of her opponent has a really bad night whenever she fights. Uh, she didn't quite have the same level of falling short with everything that she did 
uh, that she normally does. I think a lot of that had to do with the style that Rodriguez presents. Uh, she found that sidekick a lot. She kicked, she had one sidekick to the knee that seemed to... It probably troubled Rodriguez a little bit more than she let on. Uh, she got kicked in the body in the fifth and hurt pretty badly by it. Uh, so there was that, but there wasn't a whole lot behind it. Uh, ultimately, the combination work that Rodriguez put together just kind of overwhelmed Watterson, especially as far as the scoring goes. Um, you know, one of the things I, I don't think Michelle Watterson gets enough credit for, that woman can take a punch. There's a lot of uh, fighters, since we're talking about female fighters, I'm going to phrase it that way. There's a lot of female fighters who don't wear damage well. Uh, and usually the very best do. That That is a good point of distinction between good fighters and cream of the crop, top shelf fighters. Uh the ability to wear damage. And wa because I say that just because Watterson took some flurries and some abuse here that would pretty easily have ended some other other fighters I could name. That just they would have wilted a little bit under it. So you know, kudos to her. Uh, and she rallied a little bit later. Uh, in fourth round, very clearly hers. She got a takedown, had some good ground and pound, good control on the ground. And had moments in the fifth. I mean, if she had the energy to, she should have followed up on that body kick because she really hurt Rodriguez with a side kick to the body. Uh, just and couldn't quite capitalize on it. But it was a it was a decent little fight. You know, probably better than you expected if you just saw those two names on paper. Uh, Rodriguez takes a step up. I don't know when Joanna Jacek is going to be back, but um. Rodriguez and Ioana would be a heck of a fight. Uh, I don't know if they're going to try and throw Ioana right back into the title picture or not. Uh, there's a little bit up in the air about that, but... Uh, Rodriguez is a serious player in that division. Very serious. Uh, Co-main event, Alex Morono defeated Donald Cerrone via TKO punches, 440 of the first. Um... We all know the end's coming for Cerrone at this point. Look, the Cowboy is a legend of the sport. He is a fan favorite for a reason. I have gobs and gobs of memories watching that man fight. For years and years, he has turned in great fights, great performances. But... The man's 38. God, he's older than I am. And not by a lot, but he's 38 years old. Not only is he 38, he's been fighting since 2006 and has 54 fights. And that's just MMA. That, you know, to say nothing of whatever boxing and kickboxing he also did because he's done a fair bit of that too. It's the end comes for everybody who fights, man. It it just does. I mean, if you haven't seen some of his earlier stuff, his early WEC stuff, man. His fight with Rob McCullough. Um, got his first fight with Benson Henderson uh, for the interim WEC lightweight title in 2009. That's a great fight. It's a really great fight. I mean, he came into the UFC and went on a heck of a run. Uh, his fight with the, it turned in some great fights, too, man, along the way. I mean, the man's record speaks for itself. It is darn near impeccable. You know, all the bo all these bonuses that he's accumulated, he has the most... He, once again, tied with Jim Miller for most total fights in the UFC. Uh, he's... I think like the winningest, what is it, most wins in UFC history, most finishes in UFC history, most post-fight bonuses in UFC history, uh, second most wins at lightweight, most knockdowns. Uh, I mean, the man's career is legend. He's one of those guys who, despite never winning the belt, 
there's just no denying his impact on the sport and the legacy he leaves behind. And I'm not I'm not trying to eulogize his career unfairly. Uh, there's just man, look at his last fights. All right, his last win was in May of 2019 when he beat Ali Quinta. And that that was his third win in a row. You know, the man he was doing good work. Then he goes on this skid. I, I, I want to read this off. And the important thing here is there's a few things to consider. One is level of opposition, because a couple of these guys are some of the very best lightweights in the world. But, and it's it's just not easy. He fights, so after beating Iaquinta, he fights Tony Ferguson. Stopped by the doctors after round two. After he... I kind of blew his nose at the end of the break between rounds and his eye swole up shut. And they had, I mean, if you can't see, you can't fight. If your eye swells like that, you have to stop it. There's not, there's nothing you can do about that. But Tony kind of cut him up in that second round and I think would have finished him in the third if he gets to, if he came out for that, for that third round. Fights just engage you after that and TKO in the first, 418. Fights Conor McGregor, gets head ki- gets blown out, 40 seconds. Fights Anthony Pettis, loses a decision um, in fairness to him. I think I scored that for him. I kind of thought he won. Um, but that Conor fight was his return to welterweight. So then the Pettis fight. Fights Nico Price, goes to a draw that gets overturned after Price tested positive for marijuana. A guy who could possibly care. Uh... That goes to a draw, and he should have lost it, apart from the point. I mean, there was a point deduction. That's what led to the draw. But he kind of got beat up. And then here, stopped in the first. That's six fights without a win. Best he got was a draw. Now, again, I'm willing to grant you the first three of those, right? You fight Tony Ferguson, Justin Gaethje, Conor McGregor, all back to back. Like that's that's a tough ask for anybody. The only guy who could fight those three men, you know, there are maybe two. I think there are two guys who could maybe fight those three men consecutively and not lose any of those three fights. Uh, Khabib, of course, and uh, maybe Dustin. But Dustin Poirier against the current version of Justin Gaethje, I don't know. I want to see that rematch, in all honesty. But if and those, again, could be best lightweight on the planet before he retired. Gate, uh, not Gaethje, Poirier may be the best lightweight in the world right now. I think he is, for whatever that's worth. Uh, so that's a tough stretch. But it didn't get better. And he got finished in all of those. And... And Cowboy knows the end is coming. Nobody does this forever. I think he's just looking for the right moment to go out. And that can be a that can be a tough demon to chase, man. Because you might never get it. There's the number of people who have had a kind of storybook end to their career in fighting. That's a short list. Plenty of people have been set up for it. I mean, they set up Dan Henderson for it. He fights Hector Lombard in not exactly his hometown, but he tra- but right around where he trains. And he gets this crazy comeback knockout. And it, everything was set up for him to get this moment, this win, at this location, and call it a career, and he doesn't. Uh, and then you just start... Uh, the number of guys who have tried to chase that I just need a win I just need a win I'll go out I want to go out on top and then you either never get it or you might get it and go but I can win maybe I don't have to retire it's it's a brutal cycle and it is hard to get out of it and I don't know that the UFC will cut Cerrone I wouldn't be shocked if they did quite honestly uh, just looking at the sched- uh, at his recent performances, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, by the way, the, the miles on Cerrone is to say nothing of all the stuff he's done in his downtime. 
Uh, I mean, the man had an ATV accident that uh, cost him a bit of his intestine. I forget how much they had to cut out. But he has lived an active life. And he has paid the physical consequence for that. I'm not sure he'd trade it for a whole lot. You know, it's a decision. It's not a, you know, it wasn't forced on him. But that bill comes due. And at almost 40? Yeah, man. Uh, it's kind of time. And I, I hate to say that, but I, I think it's probably true. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not his fault, you know, I'm not him, I'm not in his life, I can't tell him what to do, but I think sooner rather than later, maybe one more. I mean, if you could, that was one of the because this was supposed to be him and Diego Sanchez before uh, Fabia and Sanchez went publicly off the deep end. I talked a little bit about that last week. Some new stuff came out. This last week about that. Um, uh, I think Fabia accused Dana White of sleeping with female fighters. Which, I don't know if he has any evidence of that. Uh, I will say this. That is probably... That is probably the least outrageous claim he's made of all the stuff he's thrown at the UFC. Oh, the promoter sleeps with female fighters. I mean, again, I have no evidence that Dana White has done that. None. I want to be very clear about that. But I wouldn't be shocked if it were true. It would, and to be abundantly clear, as long as it was consensual, it would not be the worst thing a promoter has ever done. I. <laughs> but that man's asking for... Fabia is going to shoot his mouth off about the wrong thing, and he's going to wind up in serious legal trouble. So there was some training footage leaked, I think of some of like his training stuff with Diego where Diego's suspended inverted and he's kind of hitting him in the head. I mean, we're not talking he's not wailing on him, but he's, you know, firm enough shots. Like that doesn't help anything. What are you doing? Uh, that is going to that's going to end badly. Um, there's a couple of videos that BJJ Scout put out about this, uh, going a little bit into Fabia's history and detailing some of the timeline of events and whatnot. Uh, that's that's just going to end badly unless something happens. This We've all kind of seen this story before, right? We've seen this movie before. It doesn't end well. I hope the people in Diego's life are able to make some kind of a reach out to him and make some kind of a positive effect on him because I'm, the way things are going is again that is not going to go well. But uh pretty big win for Morono who stepped in on short notice, so you know kudos to him. He's coming off of a loss to Anthony Pettis. I mean, Morono's a decent enough fighter, but he's not... I mean, he's never really proven to be a consistent top-level guy. I don't know, maybe this'll... Maybe this'll do some... Uh, you know, help raise his profile enough. I mean, he's a young enough fighter. He might... Morono's been with the UFC for a deceptively long amount of time. He debuted for the UFC in 2016. Uh, so he's been there over five years. It was January. And he's won more than he's lost. It's just that the losses, when they've happened, have been at the wrong time and have kind of derailed him a little bit. Um, but he's 30. He's been with the UFC for five years, so he might be hitting his stride finally. Again, we'll we'll just have to wait and see about that. Uh, so that was your co-main. Let's see what else. Neil Magny defeated Jeff Neal via unanimous decision. 229-28, 130-27. This wasn't a bad fight, but how do I say this about Neil Magny? Neil Magny is in danger of becoming the Ryan Bader of light heavyweight, the, the Ryan Bader of welterweight. By which I mean this. When Ryan Bader left the UFC, 
he was maybe the number one contender to the light heavyweight title. Certainly one of certainly top five in the division. Maybe even top like three. Like, top shelf, one of the best light heavyweights in the world. Still is one of the best light heavyweights in the world. And he's not where he used to be as far as that weight division goes, but you know, still, top shelf fighter. Could be in the UFC right now, and I might favor him to beat Jan Blachowicz. Just throwing that out there. That's not a knock on Jan, that's just how they match up stylistically. <laughs> and the, uh, So, I, the UFC cut Ryan Bader, or his contract lapsed and they didn't resign. I forget the specifics. Ba- when Bader left the UFC, was one of the top fighters in the world could beat the majority of that division but couldn't beat the very top you know got knocked out by anthony johnson in brutal fashion uh, had lost badly to john jones um what was the other one the machida knockout loss wasn't great wasn't all that great for him i mean everyone memes about the tito ortiz loss but if we kind of look beyond that he just Again, those, they were the top couple of guys that he couldn't quite get over. But he could beat everybody else. And the UFC seemed to make a very calculated decision when it came to Ryan Bader. With the full knowledge that he's one of the very best light heavyweights in the world, but couldn't get over the hump to the belt. They didn't want him killing off other contenders, and stifling the division. Now, I'm not saying Neil Magny is in that spot. I don't think he's in that spot just yet. First of all, he is not one of the top five welterweights in the UFC. He's a very good fighter. He's a very, very good fighter. I'm not trying to badmouth the guy. He's won much more than he's lost in the UFC by a wide margin. In fact, he is 4-1 and one in his last five. He's only lost to Michael Chiesa, and before that he lost to Santiago Ponzinibbio. But you look at his last ten fights or so, quite well. Done very well. But he has stumbled when it comes to a certain level of opposition. Santiago Ponzinibbio, Michael Chiesa... The loss is recently Lorenz Larkin, not with the UFC anymore, and RDA, who's moving back to lightweight. Uh, I think he was ranked, what, 9 coming into this? 8 or 9? Let me look that up real fast. Yeah, he was number 9 coming into this. So if we look above him, and you know, we have Usman, Covington, Burns, Edwards, Stephen Thompson, Jorge Masvidal, Michael Chiesa, Vicente Luque, and Damian Maya. Now, I'm not saying he can't beat any of those guys, but he lost to Chiesa already. And those other guys would be tough matchups for him. Now, I'm not saying he shouldn't get a shot at those guys. He should. At this point, uh, you know, I think Luke has a fight coming. There's a few other, there's a few of these guys who are in action coming up. So this is going to shift a little bit. But, you know, him and Steven Thompson, uh, Thompson's fighting Burns. So maybe the loser of Steven Thompson and Gilbert Burns uh, should be next for him kind of guy. But if he loses that, and I don't mean that unkindly, but if he does, you really don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be the guy who can't crack the top five can't contend for a belt and who they can't use to build up the rising generation and you don't i don't mean this unkindly either the the primary consideration for a fighter is to win and neil magny wins a lot so did ryan bader there the but if you're the ufc you do consider entertainment value and name value to the equation and Magny's not... He's, he's main-evented a couple of cards. Um, he main-evented the uh, the tough finale with Gastelum, where he won a split decision. 
and he main evented the fight with Ponzinibbio where he got stopped. So, uh, okay, the Chiesa card. He main evented, uh, yeah. So, a few, a few fight nights, but he really does need to break through. And I, I, again, I don't mean that unkindly. He's probably aware of this. He's been a workhorse for the division for the UFC. He's fought a lot. But he's he's 30, and he's 33, and he's been with the UFC for a while. I mean, he debuted for them in 2013? Yeah, 2013. So, and in that, you know, what, eight years, give or take, a little over eight years, February, tw- February of 13, he debuted for them. He had a lot of fights in those eight years. And a lot of... The vast majority of his fights. He came into the UFC with eight total fights, and he's currently at 33. So, the vast majority of his career has been in the UFC. He might finally be hitting his stride in that respect. Finding the right balance of staying active with staying healthy. Really figuring out his skill set. Uh, yeah. There is a lot of finding yourself that has to happen, especially with people who debut young in the UFC, young in both age and in experience. Finding yourself in the UFC takes time and is certainly not an easy prospect. But he did it, and kudos to him. But he really does need... uh, He kind of needs to break through that, that upper tier. Because if he's not in the title picture and he's killing off rising contenders and he's doing so in spots like this, you know, third or fourth on the card or, you know, main eventing the prelims of a pay-per-view, right? That makes you very expendable. And in some cases, pruning you to allow new growth is prudent. Now, very clearly, I want to make this clear, not calling for the man to be fired. But if we're being honest about his position in the division, he needs to be cognizant of where he might wind up in that respect. Now, uh, I would say the same about Jeff Neal, uh, but he's coming off he's coming off of two losses. Now, this was a second in a row. He main evented against Stephen Thompson and lost and then this one. Um, He might need to. He's only 30. Jeez. Younger than me. So many of these guys are younger than I am now. Makes me sad. It doesn't make sad. Makes me feel old. He's 30. Uh, he's been with the UFC since 2018, so not as long. And had a good run, you know. This, uh, the loss to Thompson was his first loss uh, in the UFC. So he he might need to retool a few things. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I don't think he's in quite the same position, mostly because he doesn't have the same track record at this point that Magny does. So I, again, Magny should probably fight the loser of Thompson and Burns, and we'll really kind of see if he can break through and be a title, uh, someone in the title picture or not. So, uh, not a great fight. Not bad, but not great. Um, Marcos Rogerio de Lima defeated Maurice Green via unanimous decision, 230-26, his 130-27. This fight sucked. Um, DeLima just got Green down against the fence. Green couldn't get up. DeLima held him there, punched him in the face a little bit. Rinse and repeat. Bleh. Making us watch this that this heavyweight fight immediately after the next fight I'm going to talk about was crim- like was cruel and unusual punishment to the fan base. We went from the scramble, frantic, frenetic insanity of Gregor Gillespie and Diego Fajaya to the whatever the hell DeLima and Green was. I mean, even the the commentary team buried this fight for the entire third round, pretty much. That's how bad this was. Awful. Uh, moving on to a good fight, Gillespie and Fajaya. Gregor Gillespie wins via TKO punches, uh, basically from back mount at 451 of the second. This fight was bonkers. <laughs> These two came out. Little bit of a feeling out process. Uh, 
you know, trading some punches, both men landing. Then they got to the grappling. Gregor Gillespie is one of the most decorated wrestlers in the UFC right now. Uh, former, was he one time or two time Division One, and uh, he was a Division One NCAA champion. Uh, yeah, okay, only the one, t- only one time champion in 2007, but he was a four time All American. So every year of his collegiate career, uh, he made it to the you know top, top four or top eight of your weight class. I forget which one. So my apologies. Uh, but that's so. That alone is impressive. Then he won the darn thing. So you know, an incredibly decorated amateur wrestler in the American collegiate system. Uh, coming off of that head kick knockout loss to Gregor Gilles, uh, to uh, Kevin Lee. So he he gets a couple of takedowns and Fahea concedes absolutely nothing. Anytime his butt hits the canvas, he is scrambling, he is sweeping, he and it, the pace was nuts. They didn't stop. Anytime they got back to the feet and separated, immediately Gillespie was back in on him. And it was at the end of the first round, which Fahea won. Um, Gillespie looked very, very fatigued. I thought he was in trouble. Then the second round gets going, and he the pace doesn't change. It, Gillespie's fatigued, but after he finally gets Diego down again, Fahea doesn't bounce up right away. And he tries to, and it's at that point that Gillespie is able to out-wrestle him. He's able to get to the positions faster. He's able to move ahead of him. He's able to spin around him. Everything that Fahea does from that point on, Gillespie is able to get ahead of him and punish him along the way to the point that at the end of the second round, again, 451 of the fir- of the second, Fahea's given up his back mount and he's getting punched and he just doesn't have an answer. This was your fight of the night, deservedly so. Uh, this was this was a bonkers fight. Look this fight up if you have not seen it. Crazy, uh, crazy fight. Uh, the the only kind of shadow over this was that Fahea missed weight pretty badly. He weighed 160 and a half. So again, if we're ta- if you take 155 strictly, that's a five and a half pound weight miss. If you if, because it's non-title, if you if they give you the pound allowance for some reason, then four and a half. That's a bad miss. That's the second time Fahea's missed weight at lightweight in the UFC. Now, the first was a while ago. Um, what's the Tysimov fight, if memory serves? I don't know. No, Kabilov. Rustam Kabilov. Uh, when he missed weight. He weighed 157 on that instance. Uh, that was only February of 19. So he might have some stuff to sort out on the scale. Uh, look, might have just might have just been a very bad cut, but you miss by that much, and it's your second time missing overall. Mm, that's something to pay. That's a problem. Like that's not a one of. That's a that's a bit of a problem. So we'll see. Again, it might just be something physically that he didn't allow for. Uh, might have some food allergy that acted up. I don't know. There, there's a lot. In fairness to the weight cutting process, there's a lot that can go wrong, and it's when you miss by that much, I'm l- a lot less forgiving, uh, especially in your second miss. But it he's made the weight consistently enough throughout the totality of his career that this might that there might be things he can still fix, but that's that's not good. Uh, it, Gillespie said he wants to fight someone ranked above him next, which he should. He came into this ranked uh, 14th. Fahea was 12th. I would, as great as Gillespie versus Islam Makhachev would be, I mean, think of that fight. That would be a great fight. Uh, I don't know that that'll happen. Um, Dayush is fighting Ferguson. Hooker needs a fight. I think Dos Anjos needs a fight. Um, Felder might need a fight. Uh, we've we've got a handful of lightweight guys that we need to see a few things react to. We have some stuff coming up, so a little bit in flux. But um, 
Yeah, I, I, again, Gillespie and Makashev would be a great fight. Uh, Gillespie and Felder, if you don't want to kill off either Makachev or Gillespie, as both kind of rising contenders. Uh, yeah, so... I'm still pretty high on Gregor Gillespie. There's stuff he's got to work on, but... Uh, he's improving quickly. And... I think, again, great fight. Great, great fight. Uh, next up, Phil Hawes defeated Kyle Dawkins for unanimous decision. 230-26 is 129-27. Um, Dawkins did all right in the first, but the longer this fight went on, the more Haas was able to get things to the ground and kind of control and pound him out there. Um, uh, Phil ha his Haas's chin is still a little bit of an issue. He got wobbled a couple of times, but the man is a, he's someone to pay attention to in that division. He, he might not pan out, but he's on a long winning streak right now. Uh, I think six, six or seven fights. Uh, three of those in the UFC. He's he's not someone to be trifled with. And he might be a very viable prospect. And we'll have to see. A lot of prospects don't pan out. But uh, I'm paying attention to Phil Hawes. Anyway, that was your main card. You only had three prelims. Uh, Mike Trezano defeated Ludovic Klein via unanimous decision, 229-28, 130-27. was a little bit bull. Uh, that was a little bit bull. I thought Klein had the first, I think. I gave... A lot of other people thought the first was closer than the second. I was reversed from that. I gave Klein the first, thought the second was kind of the swing round, and then Trezano had the third. Uh, good little fight. Jun Young Park defeated Tafan and Chukwe via majority decision. Oh, God. Okay. A 30-25, 29-26, and a 28-28 draw. And Chukwe was developed... Uh, Chukwe was deducted a point in round two after his second time hitting Park in the groin. And I gave Park a 10-8 third as well. So I was 30-25, I think. Or I was 20... Uh, I was, no, I was 29-26. I think I gave Chuck Wee the first. The 28-28 card. You would have had to not only give Chuck Wee the first, which I don't think is unreasonable. You had to give him the second, which I vehemently disagree with. And then you would have had to not give Park a 10-8 third despite Park controlling the majority of that round and elbowing the crap out of him. I forget which judge gave that scorecard, but they should be fired and publicly pelted with fish heads. Shame on that judge. God. Um, good win. You know, Park's a guy that doesn't get a lot of shine. That man's got some boxing... He's got some good boxing. Uh, especially defensively. He does a lot of really good intercepting with his forearms and shoulder rolling, and he's good in the pocket. Uh, again, th not a lot of people are talking about him, and somewhat understandable. There's not a lot of oxygen for... Um, uh, a few people take up most of the oxygen when talking about you know fighters in the combat sports space, but... Uh, Parks have, Parks a pretty legitimate guy. And then kicking everything off, Carlston Harris defeated Christian Aguilera via technical submission and a conda choke. 252 of the first. Lovely finish from Harris here. Uh, he hurt Aguilera with strikes. Aguilera with a bad shot. He gets the front headlock. Transitions to the anaconda choke. Puts him to sleep. Nice stuff from Harris. Uh... So, again, your fight of the night, Gillespie and Fajaya. Your performances of the night go to Alex Morono and Carlston Harris. Don't know, no objections to any of that. That's all fine. Uh, yeah, so, short card, a kind of cursed card. <laughs> so many issues. But, thank you to everyone who read either my live coverage or my follow-up. I know this, this card didn't have a lot of hype and buzz and i completely understand why but thank you to everyone who did read my work 
that's always appreciated. All right, let's move on to this coming card. Uh, UFC 262, which I may have erroneously referred to UFC 261 as a few times. I forget. Uh, okay, your main event. This, this is a pretty good card. I'm just getting a better look at the whole thing. Anyway, main event, for the vacant lightweight title, Charles Oliveira will battle Michael Chandler. I don't... Uh, this fight is going to... I don't think this will be too much back and forth. This is going to fairly wildly favor one man in practice. Uh... Chandler, of course, debuted in the UFC with that knockout of Dan Hooker. Uh, look, Chandler... Chandler's an interesting guy to kind of try and parse out his career. You know, goes undefeated for a long time, has a couple of strike force fights back in, like, 09 and 10. Goes to Bellator, goes undefeated all the way to winning the belt. Um, yeah, he beat Eddie Alvarez in a... Dude, that first fight with Eddie Alvarez, Bellator 58 in 2011. One of the best fights in Bellator history. One of the best fights ever. Like I, I don't know where it ranks exactly, but that's a great fight. Beats Gono, defends the belt a couple of times. Fights Eddie Alvarez in a rematch. Loses a split decision. I kind of thought he won that. Um... Yeah, that was that was the one I kind of thought. He, um, Alvarez had a couple of fights with Brooks as well. That was uh, it's a thing. Those three had some great fights, and I a couple of them were very close, and I can't always remember which fight between which guy I thought the split decision was wrong on. So my apologies there. I kind of thought he won that the uh, the Alvarez rematch, but uh, not a robbery. He fights Royal Brooks and loses a split decision, rematches Brooks and gets finished in the fourth. Uh, rebuilds himself. Uh, beats. Get, goes on a run. Wins the vacant lightweight title via split decision against. Uh, he knocks out Patricky Ferreira, the, uh, the young. Uh, I hate to say this unkindly. The less talented of the Pitbulls, because Patricio is the man. <laughs> That guy's one of the best in the world. Anyway, beats Patricky, beats Benson Henderson via split decision. I, the split there kind of surprised me. I thought he won that one pretty clearly. Has a weird doctor stoppage against Brent Primus. Loses the belt. Um, rebuilds, wins a couple of fights, beats Primus to regain it, then gets stopped by Patricio. Wins a couple of fights, knocks out a... Uh, Someone whose name I don't know in Sydney Outlaw stops Benson Henderson in their rematch. So he's got this really good record. I mean, he's 22 and five overall. It's a really good record. He's one and one with Eddie Alvarez. You know, and then comes into the UFC. And here's the thing about Chandler: if you haven't seen a lot of his fights, he's got power. He's got good hands. He's not just a hard puncher. He's got some good setups. He's got some good technique. But if he can't get you out of there early with those, he goes to a lot of clinching and wrestling and will grind you out. He doesn't have a tremendous amount of finishes late. Not to say none, but especially more lately. Now, some of this is just his, uh, his him getting a little bit better, right? Um, yeah, if you look at most of his wins lately, you know, he knocks, uh, so if we look at his, his last, he's got, uh, let's see, he, yeah, beats Derek Campos in the first, Rickles last until the second, but, yeah, that was rough. Beats Frey, beats Patricky in the first, Lu uh, beats Benson via split, so that one went all the way, the Primus fight, goes the distance with Yama, uh, with Yamauchi. Uh, goes the distance with... Yeah, the, the the second Brent Primus fight is a good example of this. Couldn't get him out of there in the first. Tried. And then just went to grinding the fight out. 
loses to Patricio, and then three first-round finishes. I don't know how well that game plan will hold up long-term against Charles Oliveira, which is just to say the following. It's not that you can't out-wrestle Charles Oliveira and beat him on the ground. You can. It's hard, but you can do it. Paul Felder did it. Felder took him down, (laughs) dealt with some really tight submission attempts, and then elbowed his head through the mat. Because Paul Felder is a savage. But that's a really dangerous game to play. Oliveira on the ground is... I mean, what are you going to say? Like, there's not a whole lot to say. I mean, that Felder loss was his last loss, actually, in 2017. He chains together submission attempts very well. He's positionally very sound. He knows the ins and outs of every te- of every position. He's just... It's a nightmare to fight him there. Not Again... Not that he can't be fought there, and not that he can't even lose there. Both Anthony Pettis and Ricardo Lamas submitted him with guillotine chokes. Usually uh, those came off of bad shots from Oliveira once he got tired. Now those were featherweight fights, and he should never have been at featherweight to begin with. Uh, but that's a whole other thing. Not not really going to talk about that. Whole other thing. <laughs> It's not as clear that he'll get that he gets as tired at lightweight because he hasn't. He's still a little soft to the body, so I'm a little curious as to whether or not uh, Chandler might be able to capitalize on that. I mean, Kevin Lee did a good job of kind of wrestling with him before getting caught in the guillotine uh, in the third. But you know, look, uh, the other thing that Oliveira's uh, done really good. He's improved his takedown game, uh, and he's solidified his control a lot more. He used to be a lot more frantic, uh, you know, diving on stuff uh, before everything was properly set up or giving up position. He doesn't do that quite as much as he used to. It's a, it's a mature adaptation from him. But I don't know how eager Chandler's going to be to dive into this guy's guard uh, after if, he, if this gets out of the first. He might have no. He might be able to do it. I'm certainly not discounting that possibility, but that's not an easy place to fight Oliveira. No, there is no easy place to fight Charles Oliveira. No easy place to fight Michael Chandler either, for that matter. But uh, so I'm a little bit curious about that. When it comes to Oliveira, we're talking about a guy on a long winning streak, especially long for lightweight. I mean, when is he one in a row now? Jeez. Eight? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, eight. Um, seven of those are finishes. Submitted Clay Guida, submitted Christos Yago, submitted Jim Miller, submitted David Tamer, TK of Nick Lentz, knocked out Jared Gordon, submitted Kevin Lee. And his last win, when he beat Tony Ferguson, I mean, that performance is... It's a thing of beauty. I still don't know how Tony Ferguson didn't tap to that armbar in the first. That makes no sense. Right? The only thing I can think of... Well, let me rephrase this. The reason that armbar... The primary reason that armbar did not end the fight was not that Tony didn't tap... It's that the round ended before Oliveira could decide, okay, you know what, screw it, I'm breaking the guy's arm. Because that was about to happen when the round ended. (laughs) But if we just talk about the guy in the hold, I said this at the time, there are world champion grapplers who in that position tap. There are world champion MMA fighters with great grappling acumen who tap out in that position. I don't know how he didn't tap. (laughs) It's it's just insanity. And not all insanity is bad. But, uh, so, 
Oliveira, I tend to think the longer this... Go we haven't seen Oliveira's gas tank really tested. Uh, the two fights he's been in that have kind of gone long, the Kevin Lee fight went into the third. That was your main event for that card. And then the Ferguson fight went the distance at three rounds. We don't know how he'll hold up against a heavy pace. That's a very real consideration. Part of the book on him at featherweight was how quickly he would gas. He, if you could deal with his first round, you could probably beat him. He didn't, I'd say he didn't win a whole lot outside the first at featherweight, because that's not true. But the longer the fight went, the worse it tended to go for him. Um, that also varies a little bit depending on level of opposition. Uh, or people just caught him early. I mean, he's got a lot of first-round losses. Um, I shouldn't say a lot, but actually, yeah, I am going to say a lot. Of his eight career losses, all of which have come in the UFC, the Jim, his first loss was the Jim Miller knee bar. That was in the first. Donald Cerrone stopped him in the first. Cub Swanson stopped him in the first. Frankie took him the distance. Max Holloway stopped him in the first. That was a little bit wonky with the neck injury, but still. Uh, Pettis stopped him in the third with a guillotine. Lamas in the second, and then Felder in the second. So, it's not uncommon for him to get stopped. He can be caught early. Uh, he's very upright with his posture, which he uses to his advantage. Again, th that's not to say it's a horrible choice. It's a choice. Every bit of... there's Because nothing is perfect. Every stance you choose, posture, hand position, etc., there's always positives and negatives. There's always opening... There's always vulnerabilities that it protects and other things that it leaves open. There's That's just the way it is. He chooses to fight the way that he does for very specific reasons. There are vulnerabilities to it. There are vulnerabilities to everything. He's, he's good on the feet. He's good about fighting long. And again, you get him on the ground, you, you better watch yourself, man, because he will test every element of your game. He will test every bit of your positional knowledge, every bit of your scrambling, every bit of everything. And I... Again, I think whoever wins this, it's not... This is not to say the fight is not close. But I don't think we're going to get a back-and-forth war out of these two. Might be wrong. I just don't think so. And it doesn't mean that Neither man is capable of winning, or that one is not capable of beating the other. They are both very capable of beating each other. But the way these two fight, I tend to think whoever wins this is going to win it fairly dramatically. Now, maybe that's a wide decision. Maybe it's a stoppage. But I... Again, I just don't see these two having a blood and guts back and forth affair. I can see either man winning. But whoever wins this is probably going to win it uh, convincingly. Put it like that. Uh, as for who I think will win, I... I really don't know. I, I They're both so good. And they're both good in areas that can attack the other's vulnerabilities. Chandler's a fast starter with heavy hands uh, and, you know, a ton of grit and a lot of wrestling. And that can be a real problem for Oliveira. Oliveira is a accurate, fairly powerful, diverse striker at different ranges who uses kicks, knees, and elbows very, very well and is a masterful jiu-jitsu practitioner in, in the MMA context. Like, tell me how there is no way either man could win that would shock me. And you know, I'm going to include Chandler by submission, depending on the submission. Look, if Chandler pulls off a heel hook, okay, that'll shock me. Chandler pounds Oliveira down, gets his back and chokes him out, or... Oliveira takes a bad shot after eating a horrible shot to the body and leaves his neck exposed. He's done that before. That's not going to shock me. 
Oliveira could knock Chandler out. That's not going to shock me. Oliveira could submit him. That's not going to... Like, I don't... The only thing that would genuinely surprise me in this fight, again, there's there's specifics of, you know, individual interactions that might shock me. I think the only thing that would really surprise me is if we get a genuine knockdown dragout war between these two. I just don't think they match up that way. I might be wrong, but that would shock me. Either man winning, not going to shock me in the slightest. So, where do I lean? God. I don't know. I'm going to lean Chandler. And I'm going to lean Chandler for a specific reason. Oliveira has not faced a lot of big punchers lately. Um, who was the last big puncher he faced? Maybe Felder? Um, okay, if you want to go back to Featherweight, Jeremy Stevens is a pretty big puncher. So he's not faced a tremendous amount of big punchers. I think that's, that's again, he's fought some guys who will put hands on you for sure. But he's not faced a lot of, you know, the Michael Chandlers of the world kind of punchers. And I think that might be a problem. Um, again, I, I could be way off base here. But that's kind of my read on things at the moment. So I'm going to lean ever so slightly to Chandler, but who knows? And let's be honest about the following... Whoever wins this is keeping that belt war is probably keeping that belt warm for Dustin Poirier. I think I think Poirier is the best lightweight in the world now that Khabib's retired. Doesn't mean he can't be beaten. Look, Conor McGregor might beat him in their rematch. He might lose when he challenges for the belt. Being the best does not mean you're unbeatable. You can look up any number of times at any other sport. When the best team would lose. When the best... I mean, look at the Olympics. The best wrestler doesn't always win. The best boxer doesn't always win. I am, and this can go from whatever sport you want to choose. I don't care. The best gymnast in a specific event doesn't always win. Uh, it's... So, again, being the best doesn't make you unbeatable. But I would favor Poirier over either of these two. Uh, for whatever that's worth. So I'm going to lean Chandler, and I I eagerly anticipate this fight. Co-main event. Another good fight. Tony Ferguson and Benil Dariush. This fight is going to be crazy. <laughs> Just going to throw that out there. Tony Ferguson is on his first two-fight losing streak ever. Uh, he had that ridiculously long winning streak snapped when he was stopped by Justin Gagey. Then got... How do you say? He got smoked by Oliveira. That was not a competitive fight. When that fight was going on, Oliveira won pretty much every minute. Which I found surprising. But there it is. And then we have Benil Dariush, who's long been a top lightweight who just couldn't quite break through. Uh, he's on a good winning streak. Most of those finishes uh, coming off a split decision win over Fahea. Uh, I actually thought... The split surprised me a little bit. I thought that Dariush was a clearer winner than the judges seem to think. Um, I hate having to think this much about whether or not I'm going to pick Tony Ferguson, but here we are. I mean, the man is, you know, 37 with fights and injuries that have piled up. I mean, Dariush is not a spring chicken. The man's... He's only 32. Good grief. Okay. 32, not a spring chicken either. At lightweight, but... That five-year gap between 32 and 37 in the athletic... In athletic endeavors is... That's a lifetime. Ferguson might be slipping. I mean, it happens to everybody. 
And Daryush will... Daryush is an animal. That man will get into a dogfight with you if you want a dogfight with him. Uh, I don't know. It's another one. I'm not... I'm going to lean towards Tony Ferguson. But at this point, I genuinely wonder how much of that is more emotional than logical. Let's put it like that. That's a... That's a good fight on paper, though. Again, Daryush brings the heat. Ferguson brings the heat. Let him fight. This is... A, a, put it like this. This is a very important fight for Tony Ferguson. If he loses this fight, if he drops three in a row... Uh, that... That will be very telling. Very telling. And would be the biggest win of Daryush's career would put him into the title picture. Somewhere in the title. Where exactly, I don't know, lightweight is. There is an embarrassment of riches at lightweight. There just is. <laughs> There's no two ways around that. But it's a good, again, really good fight. I I tend to think that'll be your fight of the night. There's others that can challenge it, but uh, looking at it on paper, I think it's that one. All right, moving on. Middleweight. Jack Hermanson and Edmund Shabazian. Hermanson coming off of that uh, loss to Marvin Vittori. Boy, he scratched the crap out of Vittori. Did you see Vittori after that fight? I mean, physically scratched. Get your nails done, man. Don't come into a fight with nails like that. Just not a good thing. Uh, Shabazian was on a good run, then ran into Derek Brunson and couldn't really deal with him. Um, I'm going to pick Hermanson here. Look, Shabazian has skill, and he could win this fight. I don't mean to downplay his abilities here. But uh, I, I won't be shocked if he wins. But I think Hermanson is better all around. And I think we saw Shabazian have issues the longer a fight goes. And that's a problem. It's a fixable problem, and maybe he has addressed it. But it's a problem. And I also am always hesitant to pick uh, students of Edmund Tarverdian. I'm, j I'm just going to say that. Um, yeah, that's. I don't have anything to add to that. Tarverdian has coached a few people to su some success in the UFC that I feel was more indicative of the innate abilities of those fighters than a whole lot that he added. Um, but, in somewhat in Tarverdian's defense, he is not the worst coach to have fighters in the UFC. And he is not, to the best of my knowledge, the worst coach in the world. Uh, which, that may be an unbelievably low bar to clear, but I want to be fair to the man in that respect. Uh, women's flyweight, Caitlin Chukagian and Viviani Araujo. Uh, Chukagian beat Cynthia Calvillo in her last fight. Wasn't a great fight. Um, Araujo. On a two-fight winning. I mean, I need a reason to pick against Chukagian at this point. And... I mean, I think Chukagian's only losses in... She's had some losses in the UFC, but... Two of them were split to Liz Carmouche and Jessica I. She probably should have won the I fight. Then her losses... The other losses are to, um, what, Shevchenko and Jessica Andrade. you got to be really good uh, to at flyweight to beat Caitlin Chukagian. Um, or just have the most boring fight possible and hope one of the judges randomly gives it to you. Uh, but I'm going to pick Chuke again. Uh, for whatever that's worth. Alright, featherweight. This is a good fight. Shane Burgos and Edson Barboza. Um, yeah, this is a really good fight. Barboza coming off the win over Makwan Amir Khani. Uh, Burgos lost to Josh Emmett. It was a good fight. 
I'm going to pick Shane Burgos here, but there's a couple of... I want to make... Barboza doesn't deal well with pressure. That's still a problem of his. And Burgos is nothing but pressure. Now, the pace of Burgos might be a little bit too methodical and will allow, might allow Barboza to fight okay while under the pressure, but I'm, I'm going to pick Burgos. That fight's going to be crazy. <laughs> um, if your fight of the night isn't Ferguson and Darius, it's probably Burgos and Barboza. All right, as for the prelims, Hinaldo Jacare Souza will fight Andre Muniz. Kind of the last stand for Jacare at 41 on a three-fight losing streak. Um, yeah, he's he's kind of in a must-win here. I think he will, but wouldn't be shocked if he loses. Uh, Matt Schnell will fight Rogerio Bonterin. Schnell's bounced between bantamweight and flyweight. Um, he's only had one loss in his last six fights when he uh, got knocked out by Alexandre Pantoja. Beat Tyson Nam in his last fight. I I'm gonna go. I feel okay picking Schnell here. I mean, Bonterin has uh, two and two in the UFC and on back-to-back -back losses. Yeah, uh, I'll pick Schnell. Another women's flyweight fight, Andrea Lee and Antonina Shevchenko. Andrea Lee has a lot of physical ability, but boy, does she have to figure things out. She's on a three-fight losing streak. Two of those were split. One of those I thought she won, the Murphy fight in particular. Kind of thought she won the Calderwood fight, too. Uh, but if... She really needs to have sorted out some of the stuff in her uh, in her preparation and whatnot. She's 32. Again, not the oldest in the world, but... Uh, if she if she's not going to sort things out in the near future, she probably never will. Uh, Antonina Shevchenko coming off a win over Ariane Lipsky. She's you know she's a good kind of all around fighter. I I just struggle to see her really excelling, I suppose. So I'll, I'll pick Andrea Lee, but uh, that one could go either way and. Might be kind of do or die for Andrea Lee. She loses four in a row. They will probably cut her. Uh, as for the early prelims, Lando Venata will fight Mike Grundy. Um, <sighs> Grundy's had a... He's one and one in the UFC. Loss was to Movsar Avoyev. Whereas Venata... Uh, Lando Venata is Lando Venata. Uh, I'm actually going to pick Grundy. Probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. Middleweight, Jordan Wright and Jamie Pickett. Eh, I'll pick Wright, but eh. Again, that one could go either way. Uh, Gina Mazzani will fight Priscilla Cachoeira. Please, can we just... Why? Why? Cut the loser, and then cut the winner. Yeah, I... I mean, Mazzani's at least want to fight the UFC. And I think, in fairness, Kashwaya did win her last fight after losing three in a row. Picking Mizani, please send Priscilla Kashwaya away. She is... Ugh. And kicking everything off, Kevin Aguilar will fight Tucker Lutz. Um, Aguilar had a long winning streak, and he's had a rough three-fight stretch. Um, losing a decision to Dan Ige, got stopped by Zubaira Tuhugov, and then had a tough fight with Charles Rosa. Again, went to a split decision. Could have gone his way. Uh, I, I seem to recall thinking it should have, but I might be mistaken. I'm okay picking Aguilar here. I still think he's a good fighter, but he kind of needs the win. <laughs> and somewhere on this card, Christos Yagos will fight Sean Soriano. Uh... Soriano starting his second UFC run. He went 0-3 from 2014 to 2015. Uh, he's coming back now on the back of a three-fight winning streak. It's a short notice thing. Yagos was supposed to fight somebody else. Uh, Joel Alvarez. Um, how's Yagos done? 3-2. Yeah, I'll... I'll pick Yagos there, but won't be shocked. 
Yeah, I'm going to pick Yagros. I, I feel okay about that. Um, that's, that's not a full-on one-fight card for the pay-per-view, but I hope they have, I mean, in theory, Benil Daryush can sub in for either Oliveira or Chandler if something happens to either of them. Uh, but there's not a lot on that card. There's, if you lose that main event, you're, you're kind of relying on the existence of the title being fought for to sell this thing. There's value on that card. There's some good fights on that card. There's not a lot of saleability to it, if that makes sense. Uh, so, again, but there's some, again, there's some good fights there. Burgos and Barboza should be nuts. Ferguson and Daryush is kind of guaranteed to be nuts. And we're going to get a champion crown between Oliveira and Chandler. So, it's a, look, the only weak fight on the main card is Chukagian and Araujo. The others are all very good fights. So I will co- I will have coverage of that in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania on Saturday. Please do stop by, say hello. I always appreciate it. All right, moving on. I've got some just a little bit of catch up here. Um, Bellator had an event. So did the PFL. Uh, the big thing coming out of the Bellator card: um, Sergio Pettis winning the Bellator Bantamweight Championship. You know, somebody pointed this out. Uh, we're about a year removed from Henry Cejudo retiring. And a lot of people don't like Henry Cejudo. I can understand why. <laughs> but Cejudo is not built, I think, for sustained success. Let me be careful how I say this. If you look at his, you know, Olympic gold medal run, supposed to lose every one of those matches in the Olympics. I think it was the underdog in every every match he fought. And he went on to win the gold medal. The next Olympics couldn't even make the team. And he tried. Um, (laughs) The man had a phenomenal amount of success in a short period of time. And that deserves a ton of credit. He... Got a win over Demetrius Johnson for the flyweight belt. I didn't. I did not score that fight for him. I maintain that. But officially, it's a win. And at this point, I think if they were to have a rematch, I would favor Cejudo. Um. Yeah, just the way they've both gone, the way they both looked in their last couple of fights, uh, would favor Cejudo in a trilogy fight. Just put it like that. And not. I love DJ. I mean, I, again, I thought DJ won their second fight, but my vote doesn't count. So, so beats the best flyweight ever, beats one of the best bantamweights ever in TJ Dillashaw. Whatever, it, I was okay with the stoppage. Whatever you feel about it, you feel about it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, being impacted by Dillashaw cutting down to 125 very inadvisably. Moves up to bantamweight, fights the number one contender, beats him to become champion, beats the other. If you were to rank the best bantam, the greatest bantamweights of all time in MMA history, I mean, you're going to have a short list because the division hasn't been all that. The division has not been high enough profile for a long enough period of time to have a really deep list of greats. But Dominic Cruz and TJ Dillashaw are probably your top two. Pretty safe to say. Doesn't mean they're the best bantamweights in the world right now. That's Peter Yan. But those two are probably the great, the two best if we're talking careers overall, right? And Cejudo stopped both of them. And I was okay with both stoppages, more or less. I could, I thought there was a bit more of a case for Cruz to complain about the stoppage. I still was okay. I'm still okay, especially as time has gone on. I've watched that again, and I'm okay with it. I really am. Uh, and so he holds wins over the best flyweight ever, the two top bantamweights ever, the guy we all thought was going to be cha- bantamweight champion in Marlon Merdice, 
And he beat Sergio Pettis earlier, so technically he holds a win over the current bantamweight champion of Bellator. Uh, again, I'm not a, I may not be a fan of Henry Cejudo's, but a lot of people, and so at times myself included, have downplayed the man's achievements because his persona is such a ugh. His persona is an ugh. The physical manifestation of the phrase UG is Henry Cejudo's online persona. Straight up. Just leaving that out there. So, but Anthony Pettis became Bellator uh, Bantamweight Champion, beating Juan Archuleta. Good performance out of Sergio, in all honesty. Uh, Very mature performance. Not a barn burner of a fight, but one he won, pretty clearly. Um, I think the bigger thing coming out of that this last event was Anthony Johnson had to fight a replacement fighter after the commission would not uh, license Joel Romero, some kind of issue with his eye. Um, and we got a pretty crazy fight out of those two. Uh, I forget the guy he fought. It's, his name escapes me. Almost finished Rumble in the first. Got real close and then... Uh, Johnson survived, persevered, and blasted him with a right hand. <laughs> um, yeah, great, uh, really good fight. It really was. It was a not the longest fight in the world. Again, like a round and a half, give or take. But nuts. You know, a lot of momentum swings. Uh, one of the first times I can remember, one of the knocks on Rumble Johnson for a long time was he didn't really deal well with adversity. You know, you you got an if you could get ahead of him, uh, he he could not come back all that often. That seems to first time he's done that certainly in a while, if uh, if ever. I'd have to double check. So kudos to him. Uh, he advances in the tournament. Now the Bellator light heavyweight Grand Prix continues. Uh, he'll fight. Oh God, who's he gonna fight? Let's see if I can find the brackets again. Let's see. Um, skipping all. Wow. They. Hmm. This is listed very oddly. Gonna throw that out there. Um. All right. Hang on. Here we. There was that. It was the featherweight tournament. Okay. Uh, oh, he fights Nemkov. That was it. I, I forget who was on which side of the uh, brackets in that respect. That's going to be a heck of a fight. Uh, that is going to be a heck of a fight. I tend to favor Nemkov. I tend to think he's going to win the whole thing, but... Uh, That'll be a good fight. It'll be a... Um, oh, it was Jose Augusto. Why did I think he was somebody? I don't know. My mistake. Um, yeah, again, it was a it was a pretty wild fight, and good on. I. Uh, yeah, good on uh, Davis winning. So we will see. Uh, I don't think we have a date for the semis yet, but we'll see that at some point. And. Yeah, so, you know, that kind of my thoughts there. Um, again, the other event, yeah, we had, um, no, yeah, the boxing, sorry. Don't know why I blanked on that. Um, Canelo Alvarez, the biggest star in boxing and one of the pound-for-pound pound best boxers in the world, where you rank him exactly, and that is somewhat up to you. I tend to think he should be no worse than third, but that's just, that might just be me. Uh, he... Uh, he and Billy Joe Saunders had a heck of... This fight was a lot closer than I expected. And I think a lot of a lot of people lost their minds over... The, Canelo wins via doctor's uh, corner stoppage after between rounds 8 and 9. He caught uh, Saunders with a right kind of shovel punch, actually, as Saunders was crouched. Caught him right in the right eye and seems to have uh, broken the orbital bone. The eye swelled up and... It didn't swell the way a lot of, especially if you're only an MMA fan, 
you're used to seeing guys with horrible swellings and gashes and whatnot, and fights just continue. Uh, they're a little bit more sensitive to this stuff in boxing to their benefit, I think. Um, and look, the other thing was the location of the swelling. The swelling was all like under the eyebrow. Uh, and so all was like within the orbital bone. And there was no way to really get the swelling away from the eye so it could be open. The eye was basically swollen shut. If you can't open your eye to fight to see, you can't fight. It was the right call. Uh, but Saunders, to his credit, he fought very, very well. Um, I had him winning, I think, three of the eight rounds. Uh, which I think is fair. Uh, so I, I had Canelo up, but he fought very well. Found some openings. Uh, to the point where I wouldn't hate a rematch at some point down the road. But Canelo has now con collected all but one of the 168-pound belts. The last one not in his possession is held by Caleb Plant. And Canelo's stated goal is to unify all the belts in this weight class. So that fight will be next. That's, his, again, his stated goal. That's the fight he wants. Plant wants it for the big payday. And I don't like his chances to beat Canelo. But somebody's going to do it at some point. <laughs> May as well take your shot. Uh, uh, it was a good fight, uh, a lot better than I think uh, a lot of us expected. The co-main event for that card, though, look, boxing cards are kind of one-fight cards, especially as they sell them. The co-main event, though, was for the, um, geez, what was it? Was it light flyweight? I want to say it was the light flyweight fight. It, um... The stoppage in that fight was a little bit dubious, uh, but it was crazy for as long as it lasted. I think it was stopped in the 8th, 8th or 9th. Uh, look that fight up if you haven't. Uh, the participants were, oh, crap, I can't remember their names, which is, which is really sad because it was a good fight. Let um, me grab that real fast, because I, I wanted to mention that fight. Uh, let's just have a look through here. Uh, Elwin Soto, that was it, and Katsunari Takayama. Yeah, it was in the ninth round. Uh, n uh, bonkers fight. That was a pretty bonkers fight. <laughs> uh, so... Please, so uh, look that one up if you're interested. I, you will not be disappointed. That was a good fight. And, yeah, that um, I brought that up just because I did some a live watch-along with Pat Mullen and Mark Radulich. We talked about the fight as it was happening. Had some laughs, talked some fights. Uh, had a good time. I, I was fortunate that the UFC event ended in such a, uh, a timely fashion that I was able to do that, so... Thanks to that card for falling apart, I guess. Uh, yeah. So you can you can find that over on the W2M network, uh, wherever your greater podcasts are found. Uh, again, a good, a good time was had by all, if you're so inclined. But that's kind of it. Uh, let's have a quick look at Twitter, see if anything has broken, and we will get out of here if not. Nope, nothing crazy in the MMA world has broken over the last little bit. So, plugs. Oh, I got stuff. This is a busy month for me. And, uh, yeah. So, Tuesday, there will be a Damn You Hollywood for the Guy Ritchie-Jason Statham collaboration, Wrath of Man, which was your number one movie at the box office this last weekend. I haven't seen it yet, but will, of course, before I review it, per usual. So be on the lookout for that. Thursday, I will be part of a TV party tonight for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. That will be myself, Mark Radulich, Alexis Haina, David Wright, possibly Andrew Graham. So we might have a packed panel there. But uh, you can be on the lookout for both of those. Again I, haven't, again, I haven't seen Wrath of Man yet, so I can't give you a teaser for that, but I will be reviewing it. We should have, we should have a good time. It seems like a quality film. Um, as for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, 
I will probably be the only person on that show saying they didn't like it, because I didn't. <laughs> uh, tune in to hear why, and hopefully my idea, hopefully my reasons uh, make sense. So be on the lookout for that. Let me see, was there anything else this week? Oh yeah, the 14th. Uh, so the 13th, there will be a Falcon and the Winter Soldier review. 14th, there will be a Damn You Hollywood for the Netflix movie Woman in the Window. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm listed here? No, I'm not on that. That got changed. I was originally going to do the Jupiter's Legacy Volume 1 uh, comic run to set up our review of Jupiter's Legacy, the Netflix series. But that uh, someone else stepped in for that one, and I don't mind reading and talking comics, but I am not nearly as knowledgeable as others, and I'm kind of the la I'm kind of the uh, the emergency parachute portion of that, so which I don't mind to be uh, to be candid. Uh, we will be reviewing Jupiter's Legacy at on the twentieth. See, so a couple of weeks out now, but there's going to be oh nine. Yeah, that got moved to the 20th. Uh, so the 18th, there's going to be a Damn You Hollywood for Spiral. Uh, with myself, Alexis Haina, Mark Radlich, and Jason Teasley. Uh, again, the 20th will be the Jupiter's Legacy Season 1. There'll be an Army of the Dead review on the 21st. Uh, Castlevania Season 4, the 25th. And... Um, on the, also, I think also on the 25th, there will be a Metal Hammer of Doom for the Jonathan Young, uh, who's a YouTube, a musician primarily on YouTube. His, um, uh, entirely original, he, he kind of gained some notoriety for doing a lot of metal and rock covers of Disney songs and, uh, anime covers, other stuff like that. And like most people who do a lot of cover work and kind of... Uh, to kind of appeal to the masses, a little creatively stifled. So he's got a, he has a debut album, and it's not debut, he's released other stuff, but a, an original album called I think Starship Velociraptor. I will be on the Metal Hammer of Doom with Mark and Jesse to review that. Uh, so I've got a lot of crap this month. <laughs> a lot of stuff. So anyway, this particular week coming up, uh, oof. Yeah, a lot of stuff. So again, Wrath of Man, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, Woman in the Window, the big things to be on the lookout. And of course, I'll be back here next week um, for this show, as well as AEW on Monday, uh, AEW's Dark Elevation, their YouTube show on Monday, I cover. I don't know what's going on with MLW on Wednesdays. They had their season finale which I covered and featured the return of the glorious Dario Cueto. Uh, he's going to have a different name. I forget what it is. He's, he's going to have a new name in MLW, but they'll reveal, they'll reveal a lot more when they come back on July 10th. So I don't know if Wednesdays are going to just be dead or if they're going to re-air old episodes of Underground again. But if they have content that they're releasing on Wednesday, I will be reviewing it. And WWE Smackdown on Friday per usual. And again, Saturday, UFC 262. I got stuff. I'm doing stuff. Acknowledge my stuff, please. <laughs> I would, uh, a lot of stuff. All right. That's going to get us out of here for this particular episode. Thank you all so very much. Deeply appreciate your support as always. Like, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Give us a review if you can. If you've already given us a review, uh, you know, a star rating, written review, if that's the interaction format on your podcasting platform of choice please share us uh, on your social media platform of choice whatever that happens to be um including word of mouth if you know a friend that's into the, that you think would enjoy the show please send them my way all right that's it thank you very much as usual stay safe out there and please continue to be well be safe and behave